Hi, and welcome to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today in the show, we have Nancy Wiseman Atwater. She's the author of A Caregiver's Love Story. There's an excerpt from that book on Kevin MD titled, Dying is a Selfish Business. Nancy, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for inviting me. My background is I was a critical care nurse for 25 years and worked in an open heart intensive care unit. I met my husband and married, and then I retired as a nurse and started writing books. This is my 14th book. My other books are, are quite different, a little bit more on crafts and that kind of thing. This book came about because I have been taking care of Bill for a little over five years now. He has several illnesses, terminal illnesses. He's been on oxygen for over three years. And I wanted to share with people what, it, what happened when we'd go to the ER and be sent home with oxygen and what that all meant and how to take care of the oxygen. And because they don't really tell you much, they just bring you the machine and plug it in and say, go for it. Okay. So a lot of the chapters in this book they will, they will talk about the incident and then they will talk, I will talk about how I coped with it, what I did, who I called in for help, that kind of thing. I found that there's not a lot of support once you go home. The doctors are good at prescribing medications and making suggestions, but nobody helps you. The fact that I was a nurse, I believe they told me even less because they just assumed I couldn't know everything. Mm -hmm. and, and in most cases I did. But what I wasn't getting was the support for myself. And a lot of my book writing starts out as more of a journal for myself. I'm just talking about what happened, getting it off my head so it doesn't bother me all day and all night. And, and then I look at it and say, well, you know, there might be other people interested in this. So I started doing some research on what I called anticipatory grief. And I believe it's called that in the literature as well. And how it, it's sort of unacceptable to talk about the impending death mm -hmm. and hard to get therapy and families don't want to talk about it. And I don't want to see the patient when he's really sick. I want to remember in the way it was. But there's a lot of closure involved when you, when you will talk about what is happening before it happens. I, I always feel like we're waiting for the other shoe to drop kind of thing and, and what will happen and when it will happen. As far as the chapter, When a Good Cry is in Order, there's actually very good tears, the ones that clean your eyes, act, I found that in my research that I just a great big sob and good cry often makes you feel better because you're releasing those endorphins and you're, you're getting that out of your system mm -hmm. so you can kind of move on with your day. Sure. We were in the emergency room last night. We got home at 4 a.m. and I'm not sure what's going to happen today. And that's what I wanted to offer people with this book was, okay, we went to the doctor. I'm not exactly sure. And I don't go, I don't get, sound like a medical book or a medical journal. I try to approach it from the, the person home alone trying to cope with, well, they sent me home with all these medications. I don't know what to do. Sure. And, and that was my purpose for just, and a lot of it was to help myself. I, I often wonder if I'm doing the right thing. Am I handling this correctly? I, I bit somebody's head off in the emergency room last night because it was three o'clock in the morning and they were mm -hmm. telling me to get out of the hallway. I said, no, leave me alone, you know, and this is hard. And I wanted people to know that that's okay. Sure. It's okay for it to be hard. So your book is titled A Caregiver's Love Story. Now, let's talk about one of the examples that you had mentioned, very, very common, coming home in the middle of the night from an emergency department visit with a bunch of medications. It could be oxygen, as you mentioned. So 
there are plenty of people across the country in that similar position. And like you said, may not know exactly what to do. So let's take that particular example, for instance, what kind of advice do you have for people in that position? Well, you need to do your research. Unfortunately, when your, your oxygen is being delivered to your home, you may not have time to investigate it thoroughly until, you know, everything's calmed down. And we have an oxygen concentrator. We don't have tanks because mm. it's on it 24-7. And I have a chapter in the book on an education in oxygen and what PO2 means and FiO2 and that kind of thing, which are all ICU terms for people on ventilators. Mm -hmm. but but my advice would be to sort of step back and not go crazy with this equipment or this medicine. Read, read your labels. Mm -hmm. You know, you can pull up medication on your phone or, or what the oxygen concentrator does and that kind of thing. And if they've sent you home, my theory is that it's not that critical that you need to panic and start doing all these things right away you can step back and maybe take a nap because if you get home at four o'clock in the morning you may not be in good shape to be making these decisions as to what medication to give and mm -hmm. and what the doctor told me the other thing that i've found in our healthcare system is that you can go onto your online and read the doc read the notes and you might get a better explanation of what the doctor was intending by giving you this medication or, you know, or starting the oxygen. The, it, is, it is very scary. I mean, even with a medical background, this, all this stuff started arriving at my house. It's very scary. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I made a comment one time about the oxygen, about I don't want to blow up the house. And somebody bit my head off and said, well, you're not going to blow up the house. It doesn't do that. Well... No, you don't understand. You're not walking around 50 feet of tubing with oxygen running through it, uh, mm -hmm. you know, all day long. But my best advice is to try and step back, try, maybe get somebody else in the family to look up the information for you and figure out exactly what the doctor intended. And if you don't understand it, then call somebody or email somebody and get an explanation before you possibly give the wrong dose or connect the oxygen incorrectly, that kind of thing. So tell me what some of the major challenges that you face as a caregiver and how you overcame those challenges. Well, one of the big challenges is we've tried to hire help hmm. and we have gone through so much help. You know, they send untrained people who think that sitting on the couch and talking to Bill is is what we're looking for and kind of help were you looking for uh, well i was looking for someone that i felt confident leaving with him so that i could run my errands or go to the doctor myself or that kind of thing i only you know three or four hours i'm not talking about a, a weekend trip and we've had some great great people we had a gal for over a year and a half and then her husband passed away so we lost her but, but the company, well, I'm finding the companies are, are, will just accept anybody into this caregiving job. 18 mm. year we had an 18 year old who, who didn't have a clue. And I don't expect them to understand the medical terminology and that kind of thing. But when I explain to them that you need to empty the urinal, say, every time he uses it, they don't want to do that. They have to get up and wash their hands and, you know, go do these things. And most of these gals, I believe, think caregiving is just babysitting and talking to the patient. And that's not what we need. So I've gone through so many companies. I mean, I, I, I've, I've had to just fire companies because I couldn't get anybody. Mm -hmm. Or just recently I had a company bill me for two days that I didn't have a caregiver. So you, you've got to keep an eye on all that stuff along with everything else you're doing. And, and make sure that you're, you're getting the best you can for your, your loved one. I, I have found that for some, if I told them I was a nurse, they just panicked. Mm. They just thought I was going to be too tough or too strict. And so a lot of times I didn't say anything right away. And, and then, you know, kind of come up in conversation. But I had a list, you know, this is what you need to do every day. 
and and I thought I was pretty easy, but maybe I wasn't. <laughs> now, there's a phenomenon known as caregiver fatigue that sometimes is underreported. Now, can you comment on that? And is that something that you yourself have experienced? Yes, and am experiencing. I um, I am exhausted. I I take care of Bill. I do all the driving. Bill used to do all the cooking and the shopping. I never learned to cook, so I'm sort of trying to make my way through that. Plus, do everything else: the laundry, the beds, and try to keep my own sanity a little bit. I do. I do live in a in a area where we have a gym. I try to walk to the gym three or four times a week to try and exercise some of this anxiety I have. Out. There is also a chapter in the book that's entitled "I Can't Do This Anymore," and that comes to my mind quite frequently. I, I have a friend in Utah that I text all the time. And a lot of times I'll say, oh, I can't do it another day. I cannot do it. But then Bill needs something and, and he's so kind and, and caring about everything I do for him that, you know, I end up not feeling bad about it after all. But honestly, for as long as I've done it, and I've had to move us to an assisted living type place. And I've packed and unpacked a house entirely by myself. I've sold cars. I've, you know, it, it's, it's a lot. And take care of a spouse that is not going to survive. And so every day you say, what's going to happen today? What am I going to do? And what am I going to do when such and such happens? Tell us what kind of resources you have to turn to for support. I, as I said, I live in this retirement uh, assisted living type community. I have three wonderful neighbors mm -hmm. that are widows. And they never say to me, you know, we've been through this. We know what you're going through. They'll just check on us and offer to go to the store. Last night when we were in the emergency room, one of them came over and took my dog out for me. And Bill has children and we do not see them. And so I get no support at all. And I have no family. I have a brother in Missouri, but I have nobody here and I don't have any children. And so for me, his children not being a part of his death, I, I just can't help believe that they are going to be very sorry about that and ultimately. And these kids are in their 50s. I mean, they're, they're adults. And they have chosen to just, I feel like we've been abandoned, but they blame it on me. They say that I, I'm mean to them or whatever. I don't know. I don't know anymore. But you, you know, if your family isn't there, mm -hmm. then you need to go out and, you know, I don't go knock on my neighbor's store and say, listen, we're having a really bad day. But when I'm walking the dog or something, they'll wave at me and just check in. And if somebody's going to the store, do I need anything? It's just those little tiny helpful things that take some of the stress off and make, make the day a little easier so that I can then go in and maybe read to Bill or sit with him for a while or, or help him shave or help him bathe and that kind of thing. Now on this platform, you have an audience primarily of clinicians, primary care doctors like myself. So from a caregiver perspective, any messages or anything that you want clinicians to know? Well, yes. I, I would like it if it wasn't maybe so cut and dried. I know the time is short. You know, everybody, you know, doctors don't have a lot of time to see patients. Come in, see the patient, write a prescription, order the oxygen. When Bill was told that he had three to four years to live and then he just walked out of the room hmm. and eventually we have been put on hospice care and I had to I had to kind of beg for that and I didn't exp this doc I thought this doctor was one of the kindest doctors we've ever had but his day had to move on where ours just had the air sucked out of the room and we're still sitting there and I have to push Bill out to the car in the wheelchair. I'm trying not to cry. We're talking to Nancy Wiseman Atwater. She's the author of the book, A Caregiver's Love Story. And there's an excerpt from the book on Kevin MD. 
Nancy, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? And because you said your most of your audience is physicians, I, I would, I'd like you them to keep in mind, and I, I know you're taught this in medical school, that the patient is not the diagnosis. The mm -hmm. patient is a human being. And that everybody, even if it's just a pat on the back, deserves some encouragement. You're doing a good job. He's lived three years. We didn't think he was going to live that long. Just a little more help for the caregiver. Where Bill's real laid back, he, you know, you can tell him anything and he just goes home and takes a nap. But it, it, it's the, those of us out there, you know, given the baths and doing everything, that we need a break. And physicians might need to help us get that break. Nancy, thank you so much for sharing your story, time, and insight. And thanks again for being on the show. Thank you very much.